the, the VIX, the volatility index, is on its way down. Is the, uh, the risk of volatility m and is this, is this old news? This is three months ago? Or is this still something you're thinking about? And if so, what are you doing to address volatility? Michael? Um, I don't think about volatility. Uh, I think uh, the way we think about M&A is it's very strategic. So strategy defined M&A. Uh, transactions don't define strategy. And strategy, as you know, is a multi-year uh, exercise. So we look at volatility. I shouldn't say I don't look at volatility, but we're not looking at it with the lens of, oh, this is a great time. We should go buy a company. Now, if we've already been tracking something, and this might be a good time to approach, on margin, that helps. But rarely, in my career, rarely I've seen where in the downs, uh, like there's a downturn, and all of a sudden the targets start looking more attractive. I mean, we went through this exercise where I looked at, I had the team look at all the companies in our sectors that we're interested in that in the recently when there was a downturn that dropped and significantly more than 30% in market cap. And we said, okay, let's look at this with the fresh eyes. And is there something that could be, pops up as interesting? We should move on. Not one. <laughs> I'll, I'll piggyback on that, right? I mean, you know, just for those who don't know Mondelez, we are a global company present in 160 countries, right? So whenever we sit back and look, there's volatility every single day, right? So, you know, three months ago, I didn't have something in Asia, I have it now, right? Uh, a year ago, we were looking at something, there was no volatility, today dynamics have changed. So it's pretty constant for us, it is more kind of looking at the long term, right? And saying, okay, five, seven, 10 years, we're not looking at a short horizon. So yes, it's important, it, it kind of, either delays a decision making for us or makes us kind of pause a little bit, but it doesn't absolutely say, oh my God, you know, everything needs to come to a, to a halt. Uh, when COVID hit in uh, April, March of 2020, we said, you know, we thought maybe we can take advantage of the volatility, right, and see, you know, markets are tight, people would, and we didn't, f we didn't find a single situation where an asset or an opportunity would be interesting enough for us just because there was volatility, right? Um, so from a strategic mindset, it's perhaps a little different, right? We, we see it every day, we experience it every day. It doesn't make us stop. Mm -hmm. Do board members start to get nervous when deal makers bring well, it's interesting because volatility can affect valuation. So, you know, if you have some insight into something's unnecessarily volatile or it's an overreaction in some way, you know, that creates an opportunity. I mean, I agree. Strategy is long term. You're looking at things in terms of buying them over the long term. So near term and relatively short term volatility shouldn't affect how you think about M&A. Having said that, when there's dislocation and volatility, there can be opportunities to buy well. And you know, high water covers a lot of rocks. I mean, you know, you can save yourself in terms of buying an acquisition well, um, but it does worry people. I think one of the things that's happening now is you have this growing expectation that perhaps whatever recession may be looming may not be as bad as people thought it was. I think one of the things that's quelled M&A from a board member's perspective in the first couple of quarters of 2023 is whether or not you're catching a falling knife and how far is that knife gonna fall. You know, you guys know this, and we talk about it all the time, but there's a psychology to M&A, and you know, the fact that the dollar is not as strong as it was last fall, the fact that there's a potential recession looming, all of those things, people don't want to look stupid when they've done acquisitions. But I agree with both of my panel members that you really should be looking at this long term. It's not this week or tomorrow and spending 50 cents less a share on a stock. It's whether or not you can create long term sustainable value for shareholders. And those are the things you need to be thinking about. I think volatility is an opportunity. I think if you have insight into the industry and think people are needlessly nervous or mispricing in some ways, which even in an efficient market does happen, you can take advantage of that. But what's more important is finding an acquisition position that fits the long-term strategy, and then this is my bugaboo, integrating it well, because I still think the majority of value is won or lost by the actual integration of what you buy. And, you know, everyone says that, but people ignore it. 
and you know honor it in the breach, there really is enormous value to be created or lost in integration and the planning for integration. I think boards in particular are remiss in not demanding that management teams be very specific and very numeric and metric driven in terms of asking for either the stock or cash to do an acquisition in terms of their plan for integration. Hmm. All right, let's do a quick uh, open it up poll. So uh, how many, show of hands, think that in the next 12 months we're more likely to be in a recessionary environment? And then the other question will be less likely. All right, more likely to be in a recessionary environment? Wow, you guys are all such downers. All right, next, uh, less likely to be in a recessionary environment. There's some happy people out there. Tom Hurd, smiling, that's nice, okay, this is good. Um, well, the, the correlation between business confidence and M&A continues to be an interesting study. But am I asking the totally the wrong question? And I think Michael might even give me a, a, a seed that maybe I am, that every deal is a snowflake and it's got its own unique value proposition and merits. But boy, we all want a deal, right? We all are looking for a chance to get, I think as Eileen said, um, a better return, right? Um, uh, how do you think we should be thinking about these macro factors as it relates to an individual transaction, if at all? And, and is timing really an important variable? I, I have a bias. I, <laughs> I, don't think, uh, I don't think in terms of small time intervals. I think yeah. you will make suboptimal decisions in the long term if you're really focused on maximizing your returns in the short term. Uh, so what does that mean tying to what Eileen was saying? You have to get very, very clear on what your value drivers are. Uh, what is creating value for you? And so a couple of things that create value for you on the way in, you want to buy the asset at the best price that you can. If you already overpaid for the asset, you've created a lot of risk for yourself. So going into the transaction, you want to make sure you, it's priced appropriately. Second is once you buy it, what do you do with it? What is the integration strategy that you have? Can you actually extract value out of it? Part of that is that be reasonable in your projections as to what the synergies are going to be, right? Let's not promise like this is going to take over the world and then ultimately, you know, I joke with people like post audit, m and post audit is my favorite meeting of the year where you show up in front of the board and they're like, wait a minute, what happened? Um, and so be, be clear on how the synergies are being projected and what, what's driving those synergies and then ultimately, Part of the, this is part of the integration, which is what are you going to do with that asset? Are you going to manage that standalone or are you going to integrate it? Like when you look at Microsoft LinkedIn, as a great example, LinkedIn is just sitting separately. They bought it, just let it sit out there. We bought Flipkart and Flipkart is we manage it as a separate entity. Uh, so I think there are examples of some very large acquisitions that are done where we bring the organization to enable the success of these companies. So when you look at the value drivers that way, what's driving your value, and you're measuring it over five, seven, 10 years, uh, this short-term intervals don't really make sense. No. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with that. The other thing is there's lots of data that shows that serial acquirers derive more value and they're willing to be disciplined about learning from their mistakes. And so, I mean, buying well is great and it does help you. And of course, if you don't buy well, it puts you in a hole you've got to pull yourself out of. But some of that's sort of uncontrollable and unknowable. What is knowable and controllable is what you do with the asset, as you say, and having a plan for it. And, and not just a plan that's written in stone, but something that, as a CFO, I would call escape hatches. You know, something goes left rather than right here. What's the way that we can fix it? Because something's always going to go left rather than right. And so anticipating that and being nimble and being on top of it is going to drive more value than buying perfectly because you can't really control that. I mean, perhaps you have, you know, it's a pretty efficient market. Perhaps you have some inside information. Perhaps there's some technology that you have in your company that you'll combine with the new company that drives particular value that inures to your benefit. And, and that happens at times, but it's unusual because the market's just so efficient in terms of finding the, the, that value. But what you can control is the value that you extract and being very disciplined about being willing to be self-critical about what went well and what didn't go well. The serial acquirers are good because they have the muscle memory of saying, oh, we've seen this before and we know how to fix it. 
But you've got to be willing to be critical of yourself when you make mistakes. And I think a lot of times the postmortem of M&A, people just want to forget about it and move on. It's hard to be self-critical in that way, particularly in front of your board. And I think boards should encourage that in a way that people, you know, managers aren't afraid of it, but actually embrace it as a way of getting better and, and becoming an expert in terms of acquisitions. Because there are companies that are obviously better at this than others. And they're rewarded when they do an acquisition. Other companies that, uh, announce an acquisition, their stock goes down. Not all companies. But you made a good point, right? Be ready to pivot, uh, right? If everybody could forecast the macros very well and you know, get it right every single time, none of us would be here, right? We would have all gone to Vegas, made money, <laughs> bought some islands, and just you know, have a good time, right? So I think the key is being ready to pivot. You'll never get it right. You'll make a, you know, a concerted effort to, to forecasting it, predicting all of it. A year from, from now, you look at it and you say, oh my god, it didn't happen, right? But I'm ready to change. Right. And I think that's the, the challenge uh, a, lot of, a lot of us face, right? right. right. But one, th one thing if I can add is, you know, I think you have to acknowledge the fact that M&A fundamentally is very hard. This is, this is probably one of the hardest things companies do is to buy a company. And so I think if you acknowledge that and say this is not one of those things I'm just going to go buy a company and we'll see what happens, it's a very hard thing to do. And the second thing that's very interesting is there is no absolute criteria that tells you that M&A is this, what, what is success in an M&A deal? Like, you know, we, most of us watch sports, you know when somebody scores a goal or somebody uh, gets a point. But in M&A, it's kind of, it's, it's very amorphous thing what mm -hmm. success in M&A is. So you combine the fact that you start with it's a hard discipline, you combine it with the fact that the criteria for success is so hazy, mm -hmm. it makes it very, very complicated as to how you manage that and how you, to, to the point that we made here, how do you turn it into a s success for, from outside looking in? Mm -hmm. Well, and our friends, obviously, at BCG have this correlation of confidence in M&A activity, but it, um, I, I love the way we've challenged this, too. It's like it really comes down to each deal, this premise. And, and I think uh, looking at a lens of cross-border is another way to, to examine the, the same sort of challenge that we face, right? Um, you know, I think Lee mentioned, you know, currency was, was uh, probably in the fall, around the peak when we were out in... in um, you know, now it's falling, um, and you know there's a variety of, of influences, uh, um, factors that would weigh in on whether or not it's the right time or the wrong time to do a cross-border deal. Um, what's the kind of framework that you think deal makers should be applying, and what mechanisms in particular could be used to, to provide a level of confidence, both a hurdle and a protection in, in cross-border M&A. And our friends at JP Morgan gave us some, some interesting data on that, but it really sets a tone of, of the complexity that one faces that accelerates cross-border. Fine, maybe I'll uh, give it a shot, you guys. Look, cross-border is hard. Uh, <laughs> I mean, four years ago when I was, was looking at things, I said, you know, What's a big deal, right? We we should be able to do deals in Asia. You know, what's we've got the capital, we've got the support, we've got everything. It's hard. Um, I, I think the hard part, um, you know, beyond the volatility in the markets, beyond the uncertainty, I think the hard part is. Um, just how the local markets, the local environments are structured, um, the, the, the organizational structures there, right? They're, they're, uh, the success of prior multinationals, uh, in our case, uh, has a huge impact, right? Um, it is much harder than I thought it would be. Uh, deal structures are, are, are difficult to, mm -hmm. uh, to pull off, right? Creativity in deal structures is even harder to pull off. There's a lot of family-owned uh, businesses, conglomerates that are all intertwined. So it's 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 quite complex. Uh, and the solution is the the, the dil solution more is diligence? the solution is <laughs> I, I won't say it's diligence. It's it's uh, patience, knowing what exactly you want, and 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 being persistent about it. Right. Okay. Um, you have to be willing to be more flexible. I'd say you have to be more willing uh, be willing to be more flexible. If you want to do a deal outside, 
Mm -hmm. uh, the US, Europe, than if you want to do a deal in uh, a developed market. And what about governance? I think mean, better, is that part of the solution to cross board? More governance, more active governance, more involvement from the board? I, I think so. I mean, the other thing is, um, I, I think what Michael said about the, the question of what does success look like, I mean, I think the board should demand how are we going to judge this and how should we ascertain whether or not it's successful before they give the managers the right to use either you know the assets of the company, the cash mm -hmm. or the equity, as a means of doing a deal. You know, I'm a really strong believer in terms of any size acquisition of having one person in charge of it who's a very senior person, often someone who you would be considering as a potential next CEO to take over the deal. That's particularly true with cross-border deals, and if you can get someone who spent some time in or is a native of the country or at least the region in which you're doing the deal, I think it makes a huge di difference. You know, I was looking at, you've got a slide further on that talks about why deals fail. And like I looked at every one of them, and it either deals with integration or human capital. <laughs> I mean, there may be other reasons you can screw up a deal technically, but you know, if you use the right bankers and the right lawyers, and you have smart finance people, I'm not saying it's easy, but if you yeah. focus on it, you can usually get it right. I mean, currency is, you know, it's a struggle. But if you're a multinational company and you're used to hedging, you're used to swaps, and you've thought about things like that, you may not get it perfectly right, but you'll avoid real downside. But you know where you can really have like something like a deal like a sand between running between your fingers is if you don't understand local markets and you don't understand the human capital and cultural issues of the, co the company that you're buying, it can just be a f complete failure. So I think you know that's really critical as a board member to say, I, I hate this term, but is there one throat to choke? I mean, mm -hmm. is there one person here that I can say? You're coming off the line in your current job, and your full job, full time job for I would say at least 12 to 18 months is to make sure this acquisition is successful. Without that, kind of nobody owns anything, and everybody owns a piece of it. And I think it's really important for boards to demand that. And again, that should be sort of the quid pro quo for you want to use shareholder equity or cash to do this deal. You've got to tell me that you're going to make be serious about this and be willing to take a senior executive off the line and dedicate them to this. And if you're not willing to do this, I don't think you're serious about doing this acquisition. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the governance piece of it. I mean, you're governing, you're not managing. You can't oversee every iota of the acquisition, either the deal or the integration. But what you can set up is certain expectations about how the management team will be measured for success and what kind of resources you expect to be put against the acquisition to make it successful. And that senior person who's in charge of doing nothing else for that than that for a year or two, I think is a really critical aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add to that, but I would say that cross-border is no, in some ways no different than domestic deals. There's a strategy piece to it, and there's an execution piece to it. And the strategy piece is the same as how we look at domestic deals, is that you got to make sure that it's part of your either market entry strategy or your, uh, you know, it's a scale acquisition or capability acquisition. You have to be very clear what, why you're doing it and what you want to do. And then it's the execution where you have to hire the right advisors and you could usually get the execution part right, but it's the strategy part that you got to get right. And, and that's not driven by exchange rate. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and I think the other thing is there are certain behavioral finance things that come into play where I think the board can be objective and rational in a way that it's easy for the management team to get carried away. I remember one of my corporate finance professors at University of Chicago Business School uh, wrote an article that uh, was called Do Bad Bidders Make Good Targets? And what it said is basically people who go after acquisition targets and they fail and they fail and they fail, what happens is they start to get frantic. They, these are my words. And they just sort of buy something because it's like, well, everybody, we've been out, bit of everything, out of everything else. And typically they don't do a very good job and then they themselves become targets because they destroy shareholder value and their value is depressed. And I think that deal fever that management teams, you know, can be prone to myopia of well, we didn't do, we tried to do three other deals and we got outbid, so we have to do this one. I mean, that's one of many things that can go wrong in terms of how people look at M&A. But I think the board has a role to play in saying, let's sit back and say, does this really fit in the strategy? Is now the right time? And is there chance of success here? Because M&A is hard, and there's a high failure rate. You know, the the board can be. 
I mean, supportive but challenging of the management team to say, have you thought about this the right way or do you just feel like you got to buy something because you've missed on the last four or five? Uh, all right. So uh, who in the room of our members has, has been involved in a cross-border deal in the last year or so? All right, quite a few. All right, so now reward to anybody who just raised their hand who will share a lesson learned or a war story from the last year. And will you introduce yourself to those of you that don't know yeah, you already? Dan Menge, lead m and integration at AMD, a uh, semiconductor company. So uh, I don't even know where to start. There, there are plenty <laughs> of these, right? Uh, one I could think of lately, well, I would just answer the question by saying, engaging external counsel who has knowledge of the country, region, whatever, it's critical. Um, and without them, there's no chance of success at all. Mm -hmm. We had a situation uh, relatively recently where we need to get employee notification. This is kind of a GDPR related thing, but not quite. It was a different country. Without getting into specifics, it, it's still, there were, there were legal ramifications of sharing employee data. Uh, we thought we knew what we had to do, and we, we had asked the target company who was familiar with the process, and we ended up spending a couple of weeks going down the wrong path, getting information we should not have had before we were able to go back and through counsel get clearer direction. So employee data is, is always one, but there's a whole raft of other issues that I would say mm -hmm. kind of fall in the same bucket of really needing to understand through somebody who's an expert what the local requirements are. Yeah, I appreciate the comments and questions and uh, we we'll want to continue to encourage that. And I know um, some of these nuances are, are country specific. I, I noticed uh, Chris Evans over here, um, who's done some deals in, in South Korea uh, on Amazon's. We have, there's some drinking culture uh, uh, traditions one should be sensitive and aware of. And so a variety of lessons learned that can be in the deal documents or in the interpersonal relationships that develop. Uh, so now let's talk next about I innovation driven deals. We talked about cross border deals and sort of tricky elements there. But, um, you know, when we were out at Cornell Tech in New York City in September, everybody was looking to buy innovation software, IP, high growth companies, really exciting deals. They didn't make any money, but, but they were really great deals. They were growth opportunities. And you know, we sit here at University of Chicago, and so there's some rational economics uh, underpins to, to this, this fine institution that I think we want to um, heed uh, difference to. But, but my suspicion is that sentiment's changed, um, that buying deals with no uh, accretion opportunity is a much trickier career proposition for M&A folks. So, uh, you know, is it appropriate to have a little more hesitation on capability-driven deals at this point, or is that short-sighted? Well, I, mean, I think uh, <laughs> that if, if, a, if a company is trading at five times revenue, it's attractive. When it's trading at 10 times revenue, it's really attractive. <laughs> right? You really want to buy that company, right? So that kind of, that kind of a mindset encourages people that when the sector is hot, you always feel like you're chasing some uh, one company that you'll buy that's going to change everything and change your trajectory. Um, I don't think I've ever found one company or one acquisition that will make or break from a capability perspective uh, the company. So essentially, the way to think about the capability is it's a capability you're going to acquire and put it in your company. and scale it. So the framework that I was talking about, I think in my mind still stays the same. You want to go in at a good price. You want to be able to extract synergies, value out of it, and build it into a big business and create the synergies. So that doesn't change, mm -hmm. whether it's high growth company or anything. I think what changes is what Eileen said, people get deal fever. And once you get deal fever, you have to do an acquisition. And that's, I don't mean that in a bad way, deal fever, uh, but 
but there are managers face, face pressures. If you are a line manager, you need to build your business. You are in a competitive pressure. You need to, you have your long range plans. You need to show movement towards that. You need to also show innovation being added to your product set for to your shareholders. So all this can't be underestimated. And then all that goes into some of these decisions, which are sometimes suboptimal. So I think to your question, uh, high growth is sort of no different than, I mean, mm -hmm. lead with strategy, have a measured approach to it um, to the extent that you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the one advantage is the evaluations in that space are down, <laughs> you know, so now it doesn't look as rich to do that. The question to be asked is, a lot of these businesses obviously are not cash flow positive. They certainly don't have, you know, they don't have earnings. Mm -hmm. are, are they scalable and can you integrate them into your business so you can actually utilize the value of the technology? I mean, in a way that's gonna drive value. Right. I mean, that's no different than the other questions you ask yourself, but it might be a good time to buy capability because the valuations are down. They're, they're somewhat more reasonable, shall we say. And now, I mean, it's sort of like it flipped on its head. At the beginning of COVID, I was on the board of a company that went public in the middle of COVID. We hired a CFO. We put through the S1, through the SEC, all without anybody being in the room with each other, and went hot to public at a very high valuation that then crashed. But now we're on the road to profitability and cash flow positive. Now that's, there's a whole new interest in that. It's very interesting how quickly things have changed, just in a year or so. Right. Do you see a lot of innovation deals? Uh, I'd say high growth deals. High growth. Right, um, but I'd say it's, it's hard to just survive on uh, doing five, 10, 15 high growth deals, mm -hmm. right? Just to your point, you need to create the value, integrate, show that you're uh, truly extracting the synergies you thought you can extract, right? So I, to us, it's a, it's a bit of a mix of mm -hmm. deal types, right? If I just focus on high growth, I don't think we'll deliver the shareholder value that you know, our shareholders, mm -hmm. shareholders expect. Right, right. One think, thing is important, sorry. That's one, right. Please one thing ahead. that is important in high growth deals is uh, the retention of key talent, yeah. mm -hmm. the tech talent. I think that becomes disproportionately important. Um, and I've been on both sides where we did it well and where we didn't do it well. And uh, when you do it well, it really works well. And when you don't, then you basically, it goes to zero very quickly. Yeah, and a lot of those people are serial entrepreneurs, so you have to be realistic about how long you're gonna long keep realistic. them. I mean, it's not forever, but you need mm -hmm. them for some period of time before they go off and build their next fabulous thing and make a lot of money off of it. The other thing, I mentioned this before, but you know, a lot of particularly smaller tech deals, you really need someone who understands the technology you're buying to figure out if it's scalable, because a lot of this stuff is strung together. I mean, it's highly creative, but it hasn't been built to, frankly, if you're a big company like Mondelez or Walmart, that you could actually use it on your platform because it just would be prohibitively expensive or impossible to scale it. And I think it's one thing that big companies miss in looking at whiz-bang technology is whether or not they can actually load it onto their platform and spread it across you know, a really big company, either domestically enormous or you know, uh, global. Um, a lot of these things are really interesting, but they take an enormous amount of input and investment to actually make them scalable. Right, right. The M&A Academy provides guidance on strategy development, navigating material negotiation issues, and governance of the M&A process. The curriculum was specifically developed for in-house M&A professionals that are responsible for executing acquisitions. The course is led by Professor Stephen Morissette from the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business and draws on his years of practical experience executing acquisitions and overseeing post-merger integration. Let's let's take some questions too about bringing innovation-driven deals to the board, bringing those forward. Who's got questions? Rocky, thank you. Yeah, sure. Rocky Daler here. Um, do you have any examples of what some of the biggest challenges have been when you've brought an innovation deal to the board? You know, particular areas to be sensitive to, or that were difficult to get to get the board's board's head around. Well, I'll start. Rocky's at Motorola Solutions. Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I think one thing is, this is the same as with cybersecurity. I mean, 
A lot of board members are not technologists, and so they're going to be skeptical that the what even now is perhaps less, you know, less high multiple, but still a high multiple that you're paying, that this thing is really worth it. And we'll ask, can't we just develop this ourselves? What are we going to get out of this? How is it going to be utilized? All of those things. So I think overcoming that, because every board has done technology acquisitions that did not work. Now, everybody's also done just acquisitions that don't work. But technology is a black box to directors. And you know, dealing with that and addressing it in a way that puts it in a business framework so they can understand the risks and opportunities associated with that technology without having it be a lot of acronyms or a discussion of technology that's unapproachable for the layman. I mean, I know that sounds simplistic, but I really think that is important and how you're going to de-risk the deal. I think that's one thing in terms of taking any deal to a board of directors. You know, their role is to pressure test whether or not this really makes sense and the money should be spent. And anticipating their concerns about risk and fronting that in terms of de-risking the deal and not waiting for questions and being defensive about it, I think is a road to success. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. Uh, I think I think the biggest problem that at least I've found is that just the valuation of tech yeah. companies. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are trying to go to the board and say you're going to pay $500 million for a company that does $5 million in revenues and you're buying capability and how wonderful it's going to be when it all comes together three years down the line, uh, it's hard. It's hard for the board members to make that unless you're so well respected in the organization that you're putting your you know, reputation on the line or so so you just it's a process to all the things that Eileen said. You need to make sure that how you're gonna mitigate the risk, how this is gonna work. But but I find the valuation bridge is the hardest bridge for most people. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've got a question from Tom Hurd who's a member of the Institute's M and A advisory faculty. Tom? Are the boards you're on thinking more about it in non-binary terms, instead of do or don't, invest, JV, yeah. minority own, VC it? Because I, I think it's a little more complex, a little more ways to get your toe in the water wet versus diving in, I suspect. Yeah, I think that's particularly true in financial services where you know, fintech is so important and there's so many innovations and it's probably impossible for a variety of reasons to actually buy these companies, a lot of them. But can you learn from them through a joint venture or through a partnership or minority investment or things like that? Yes, absolutely, we talk about that all the time. I mean, you know, if it's something that's gonna transform your company, you wanna own it. But that doesn't mean that's always possible. And it may, it may not be achievable for a variety of reasons. So that idea of having sort of a set of investments that you might learn from, not necessarily derive that much revenue from, but actually enhance your technological platform just by having that investment, that's certainly something that boards talk about. You should build on that. I, I don't think it's a or, right? Like if you if a company is actually qualifies for an acquisition and it's strategic for you, I don't think you could go and do a JV and say, oh, I will figure this out later. But it's another tool in your toolbox mm -hmm. that you could use a JV or you could do a minority investment. Uh, so you just have to figure out, you know, to, to your point about how strategic it is, if it's super strategic, you have to own it. Yeah. Uh, and if it's not, then you have to be very clear that you're doing this for learning. When I was at Dell, we had a venture program and we would invest in uh, four areas, AI, cloud, data, and security, uh, because we wanted to learn. So we'll invest in series B and series C, always be, never lead around. And we, we had some fantastic successes, but that wasn't the point. The point was we were trying to learn as to where the puck is going and how we can incorporate that in our strategy. And that, you know, it's hard to quantify, but that helped us quite a bit in terms of keeping us out of making some silly acquisition in an area. Um, but if, if it's something that's super strategic for you where you want a differentiation, uh, I think you have to acquire or build. That's just my, my bias. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to the to the sell side, and again, our, some data from our friends at J.P. Morgan. Um, 
uh, on divestitures. And it's a, an area we're going to unpack in a lot of detail tomorrow. But in the meantime, maybe we'll just set the, set the stage a little bit. Um, it, it, my hands weren't full. I would do air quotes under the term corporate clarity, because I think that's the way you talk about sort of a buzzword. But it's certainly a, a, a hot topic, if you will. Um, the activists are pushing for simplicity and corporate clarity. You know, sh should the corporate development world be thinking in the same way, using that inspiration to bring the same lens to uh, to their business? And and you know, if so, how do you do that? Do you, do, can you test the waters? Can you get a banker to do that? And uh, uh, what are the sort of pros and cons of trying to test the waters a little bit on divestitures? I, I don't believe in testing the water, so I'll, uh, I'm not very biased. So I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> Love it. Uh, I, I, uh, look, I mean, you, you're a corporation. Once you decide something is strategic, something is not strategic. Right. Something is not strategic, you're the best at because it's worth more to somebody else than it is to you. And mm -hmm. you do that process on a strategic basis, on a rolling basis every three years, and you do it on an annual basis. And the things that are not strategic or not performing, you call them out. Mm -hmm. And somebody else is always there that that asset right. is worth more for. And even if that means that you're taking a loss, in the long term it's a win because it frees up the managers from you know spending time on something that's not yielding the right results. So and capital. Uh, and, yeah. and capital. It frees up capital. And so so once you decide it's for sale, then I mean I when I'm doing divestitures, I tell whoever the advisors are that it's really the order is speed, certainty, and valuation. Yeah would not want to lead with valuation. Doesn't mean that we're going to do stupid things. Make, mm -hmm. you, you want to make sure that it's fairly valued, but you want to lead with speed and certainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so focus is important, right? I mean, I, I think the more focused you can get and, and say, I want to do one, two, and maybe three things, that's good enough, right? Mm -hmm. If you say, I want to do five, six, seven, and eight, I, I think that's, that's challenging. Uh, so having a, at least you know, being in the food space for us, having a clear portfolio strategy, right, says, look, these are the three things we are going to do, and everything else is non-core for us, right? And you know, we've we've even said it publicly that we want X percent of our business to be in in these three spaces. The rest, you know, we'll we'll figure out what we do over time. But I think that clarity helps. Um, I think it also helps so you don't keep chasing deals. Right, you know, you, you, your, your bankers, your advisors will come give you lots of ideas and say, hey, how about this, what about that? You're not chasing, right? So your that clarity right. is, is super critical. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know you can get all sorts of advice about being a pure play because that's what the market wants. The bankers will come to you without you testing the waters and will give you valuation and thoughts about you know how it would work and what the spin-off would look like and what your stock will look like after it. You don't have to ask for it. They'll come to you with that. I mean, my only concern from a governance perspective is you have to be careful. You know, you've got to have a clear strategy and focus, as Jeet said. I mean, because if you start talking about, well, maybe we should get rid of this division, Maybe we shouldn't, you know, vacillate on it. That's corrosive to corporate culture. You've got to make a decision and move forward. And as Michael said, like clarity, speed, and valuation in that order, and 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 certainty in terms of what you're going to get, mm -hmm. I think is really important. But it's important, you know, to have a focus and drive and execute towards that, and not sort of every year say, well, we've got this division, we were never really committed to it, nobody works at it who's really got is that great, you know, we haven't put great executives in there. That that's just you know a path to mediocrity. That's a strategic process that's gone awry that the board and the management team hasn't hasn't really focused on very well. And again, as with all of M and A, this should really be driven, be driven by strategy. Why are we in this business? Does it have anything to do with the other businesses we're in? You know, does it make sense? Is it better held in somebody else's hands? And could we redeploy the capital in other parts of our business? At the end of the day, you know, classic corporate finances, the way you deploy capital is the means by which you ascertain the value of the business. And that capital allocation methodology is what should drive whether or not you're divesting something and going to reinvest it in something else. And that discipline is core to creating shareholder value. Yeah. 
Well, we've, we've had a good conversation about strategy, but let's start to get into execution. Um, and again, we're going to be looking for some, some questions and some participation. But um, our, our friends at Bain, who do really an exceptionally good M&A report every year, it's one of the best in, in, in the business, um, to, uh, talks about some of the missteps that are made in diligence. And, and you know, some of the fi you know, integration roadmap mistakes, you know, revenue synergy mistakes, cultural alignment issues. Um, you can pick any of these <laughs> and find an opportunity to add value. But let's reflect on your experiences. What, what is the typical mistake? And what do we do better? How do we fix those diligence mistakes? What, can you just grab one and, and zero in on it? Well, I think, look, forecasting synergies that are, uh, you know, a hockey stick is a pretty common mistake. And then, then you get into this cycle of trying to justify those synergies, and uh, it's it's not a not a good place to start. But having said that, if you put, you know, I'd rather see a hockey stick rather than somebody who's not excited excited about it or something. If it's just going to be a flat line, why would you make an acquisition? So that's where the art comes in. How do you make sure that you're realistic about what you're acquiring, how that's going to be, how you're going to leverage that, and how you'll forecast the synergies. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in try to do a base case, aggressive case scenarios mm -hmm. and say, what do you have to believe for this to be true? And that allows you to really, especially when you're getting ready to present that to the board and you basically say, look, this is what you have to believe. These are the six things you would have to believe for base case to be true, mm -hmm. for the aggressive case to be true. This is what you would have to believe. Uh, I think that helps. That doesn't totally take it away, but that does help. I think that's helpful. Yeah. I think I just what built else? on that. The time horizon, right? You know, forecasting synergies for how long? Uh, you know, I think you have a, a pretty decent line of sight, 12, 18, 24, maybe 36. Anything after that, candidly, is just, you know, your guess <laughs> is better than mine or as good as mine, right? So I think sometimes, you know, you kind of get hung up on the precision you want on forecasting synergies further out, or the pace with which you can, you know, get those synergies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, management, the board always wants you to get it fast, but there's a reality to it as well, right? You can only mm -hmm. do so much as an organization. So, you know, not, not trying to overshoot yourself on the pace with which you can get it, and forecasting beyond what is reasonable, logical. Right. Right. Yeah, I would just say, I think revenue synergies are really hard for directors to underwrite. And they want, you know, I've used this term before, they want you to be able to pivot and have an escape hatch if they don't show up. I mean, what are you going to do if it doesn't work and you don't get the revenue synergies you expect? Because, you know, again, that's sort of a black box for directors. You know, what the, is not a black box is the cost synergies you expect, which directors mm -hmm. should demand should be laid out in great detail and it, with a timeline that they can hold the management team accountable for. I mean, it really, boards shouldn't approve a deal without that. And the other thing I would mention is, you guys all know this, but the human capital side of things is often overlooked. I think you have to be realistic, particularly when you're buying in another country or a competitor where people don't necessarily want to work for you, or certainly with entrepreneurs, to be realistic about how long you can keep people and put things in place so that if you need them for six or 12 or 18 months, they're gonna be there. Because once you lose people's hearts and minds in the first month or so, it's amazing how rapidly you know, your talent drain can really move. And so I think you know, being realistic about, even if you welcome people and you have a great corporate culture and all the rest of it, you bought the company and people may not want to stay and have things in place in terms of trying to assure that you have the talent you need for at least a reasonable period of time. So I just realized my, my next question about diligence is going to sound like a like a joke, but it's it's actually a real question. All right, so two GCs while well, GC walks into the room, right, and presents you uh, a finding that says I've I've studied all the agreements and diligence, and I've used an AI tool to analyze all of the targets contracts. You say what? Well, AI is going to transform the legal uh, profession. I think that's certainly true. Um, and I, I talk to people about it all the time. I teach at a couple of law schools, including University of Chicago. That having been said, I mean, depending upon the complexity and the importance of the contract, there's a degree of human judgment that needs to be brought to bear in those areas that I just don't think AI is capable of now. So I think it's a starting point. It's not an end point. 
Um, and you just have to be careful in terms of relying upon how much AI is going to tell you without that degree of judgment and discretion being exercised. So it's a wonderful tool. It's one of many tools. It's not the be all and end all. That's my view. It will make a difference in the legal profession, but I think it's early on in terms of how well it can be executed in diligence. And I think you have to have a fair degree of professional skepticism and making sure that you don't rely upon it exclusively. And Michael, does this make you sleep better at night or worse at night to know that every contract is analyzed by AI? Well, look, I mean, a, a GC who comes into a room and tells me that they've just used an AI tool, I think they should look for a different job <laughs> because I don't need a GC, highly paid GC, right. to run the AI models. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't draw any comfort from any automated tool that's mm -hmm. doing everything. To Eileen's point, I think these are all tools that we use. It used to be, you know, M&A was done. Like corporate finance hasn't changed in 150, 200 years, or even longer, right, thousands of years. Basically, we still value companies the same way. The tools have changed, right? We didn't have Excel, now we have Excel. Does that mean we basically say Excel is gonna spit out an IRR? No, we still pick out the WAC, we still pick out the terminal value, and some of those things drive what the value is. I mean, so, so yeah, no, um, doesn't hunt. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree with your point that if a GC has to come in and say, I've, I've used chat GPD and the ERC answer, we're like, why? Why did I pay you $1,000 for the last 15 minutes, right? But uh, <laughs> I think the other question is, you know, what happens if you are in litigation at some point, right? Can you fall back and say, hey, the AI tool gave me this answer. Mm -hmm. Are the courts willing to accept that, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's still unproven, it's untested. Okay. Uh, but if there's one thing I would love to use AI for, if, if they can forecast and predict consumer demand for me quite accurately, oh boy, I, I'd pay, <laughs> pay anything for that tool. Yeah, well, we'll keep unpacking that. Um, uh, a couple of quick questions. So, you know, no one that pursues deals wants them to fall apart and not close. Um, best way to avoid an abandoned transaction is what? I think you have to be realistic about the antitrust risk and think about are there ways in which you can mitigate that risk in terms of negotiations with the government? What would you be willing to give up and still maintain most of the integrity of the deal? Mm -hmm. I think in addition to antitrust, I mean, sometimes you just find stuff that, you know, you going in, you didn't think that was the company that misrepresented it or they just didn't know or you find some things and you have to get out uh, of the transaction. Um, you just, I, I think you just have to do it, manage it in a way that life is long and you manage it as a good relationship and be upfront. And as soon as you find out, don't, don't just string them along, just tell them right away. As soon as you know, you gotta tell them look, this is not working out, let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be, nobody's gonna be happy about it. And so for some companies, if they're small companies, that's gonna change their trajectory completely. They were gonna be making a lot of money and now they're gonna basically not ever get acquired or because of various reasons. So only thing I would say is just kind of be respectful, yeah. manage it for a long term, right. and, and just tell them mm -hmm. as soon as you know. Yeah, call yeah. a spade a spade soon, right? Mm -hmm. Don't don't just kick it down, kick the can down, and expect that you'll figure it out later, right? If it's an issue, just flag it, and if you can't solve it, park it, move on. So, uh, Aline, you mentioned regulatory um, risks and delays, right? So, uh, hypothetically, uh, you, you see a deal, terrific asset, but your inside counsel says, you know, it could take 18 months to close. You say what? We have to think about how you're going to run the company and how you're going to interact with the target during that period of time. I mean, the Leo Burnett Publicis deal went through FTC review and took a long time. I've forgotten exactly how long, but close to a year. And we had sort of uh, protocols in terms of how we were going to manage the business. I mean, there's only so much you can do. You can't go over the line in that because you're not one company. You can risk your antitrust approval. I think, again, you have to de-risk that possibility by saying, okay, if this is gonna be a 12-month or 18-month deal, how will that affect the business and how will we manage the business to take the risk out of that possibility and are there things that we could do? And if it's you know it's unmanageable, maybe you should think about not doing that deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at the Kroger-Albertson deal. I mean, that's gonna be at least two to two and a half years that's gonna play out. 
uh, but there's a plan and they've thought through it. That's how they're working it. So as long as you kind of anticipate that and you have a plan for it, that makes the most sense. I think the worst case scenario is we think you're gonna get a deal done in six months and that drags on for a year and a half. That's a problem. Yeah, and people think they're gonna get fired and they leave. That's the other, that's a right. real risk right. in that. Right, right. Um, let's talk about our friends, the sponsors. Um, so private equity is out competing for deals. Tell us what's, and I'm gonna to start to ask for some questions too before we wrap up here, so planting the seed. Um, what are the tricks, what are the techniques and methods that you, you think are effective in terms of complete competing with sponsors? Jen had a nice conversation about uh, diligence, you know, that, that sponsors can move fast, right? And, and you know, are the strategics encumbered by big, slow diligence processes? Your team's not. <laughs> They're fast and nimble, right? Thank so uh, is that the technique? Is that the trick to competing with private equity? That is one of it, right? Mm -hmm. That is one. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of, in our space, we've seen a lot of competition from private equity over the last, call it three to five years, right? Mm -hmm. And the interesting part is that they've been <coughs> when they've outbid strategics, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of scratch your head and say, we as a strategic should be able to create more value. Mm -hmm. How did they outbid us, right? right? I think part of it is money was cheap, they were willing right. to lean in, right? Yeah, take more risk, et cetera, pay more, with the hopes of getting more out of it. Um, but the other piece is, you know, at least as we look at it, is to say, look, we think the asset is worth X, right? Um, if, if they want to overbid it, that's fine. Um, we, we're not gonna, you know, obviously come in the way of it, but uh, you, you just gotta, say this is what this is what I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think with targets, I, I mean, I serve on a PE portfolio company board and I've served on them in the past. Um, I mean, one argument you could make is to uh, the target is the CEO in particular, you're not gonna be overwhelmed with a sea of debt if you're joining this company. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the way that you are, I mean, I'm being hyperbolic, that you could be, you've gotta manage to expectations and particularly in terms of driving covenants. I mean, I will tell you, there, it's hard to pencil out deals for private equity firms using a ton of debt right now. It's just mm -hmm. really difficult. Uh, deals that looked doable a year ago are not, they're not financially viable now. And so, uh, I mean, I think there are cultural arguments that you can make that you're joining a corporation, you're used to being in a company, there's a camaraderie, you're not gonna be held to having to service a, a high degree of debt, things like that. I agree with you. I mean, the, you know, you would think that the strategic should be able to provide more value, drive more value than the, the private equity sponsors. Query whether or not they will outbid strategics now with money so much more expensive or debt mm -hmm. so much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Michael, are you competing with sponsors from time to time and seeing that play out? Yeah, um, we compete all the time. I think a lot of time I find the relationship to be quite synergistic. So we end up buying a lot of things from sponsors. Um, I think the best way to compete with sponsors is to have an active uh, corporate development program, in my opinion, uh, where you're out building relationships to target companies early on. And it's very hard for sponsors to sell against uh, the platform that the strategics have mm -hmm. and the mission driven, especially some of the founders who are more mission driven and they want to do something uh, to change the world, change certain things. Uh, it's private equity firms just don't have the platform companies. They have some of them do, some of the larger ones. Um, so I find that it's quite comfortable to compete mm -hmm. with private equity if, if you take that approach. And I'm not, I'm, I rarely want, I, ne I don't think I've ever bought a company where the banker said, oh, this is a great idea, let me show it to you. And I said, wow, never thought about it, let's go buy this big company. It's always that you've thought about it, you've been working on it, it's, it's take, so you've developed some level of relationship, have some conversation with the founders, and those relationships go a long way in terms of where the founders or the boards will sell. Now, to Jit's point, if the delta is large enough, if private equity is paying a lot of money, uh, 
that to me, frankly, is a great sign that I shouldn't be in that zip code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let them have it. Right, right. Well, we, we, we've talked a bit about, about some of the strategic headwinds, and we've talked a bit about diligence and, and competing in negotiations. Uh, let's wrap it up with a question about measurement and performance and good outcomes from deals. Um, and I realized I wrote this with the word trigger, which I guess is teenager speak for makes me mad. <laughs> So let me translate. It, it triggers me when people measure M&A based on blank because it should be based on blank. Can you help me fill in the two blanks? Typically it's measured based on what? But it should be based on something different. Actually our friends at Mercer have an interesting uh, analysis on culture integration, some non-financial metrics among others. It's um, this is a sort of tough one to unpack. Well, look, the reality is nobody knows how to measure M&A deal. I mean, that's just the <laughs> fact of life. You can, you can couch it however you want to do it. Everybody has a different perspective about what success of an M&A deal is. A lot of people will say what you paid for a deal is kind of defines whether it's successful. You paid how much? Oh, my God, you paid a lot for that deal. But on the other side of it, would, they would rather you would rather see them say, you know, how much value it created. But what does that mean? Nobody can like. Is that it's, sometimes it's easy to quantify that? But, well, the share price of the company went up. It rarely happens that the acquisition is so big. Those are those things are very few and far in between. Uh, other measures are well, you built a big business out of it. Yes, but what if that business is losing money? Is that a success? We don't know. Uh, what if you lost all the management team that you hired and you had to go and hire a whole new set of management team, but now it's a big business? Is that a success? So I think it's very, I, mm -hmm. I go back to the fact that M&A fundamentally is very hard. Everything that you all do is very hard. And don't let anybody tell you that they should have done a better job because it's, it's just when you're in that operating room and you're operating on the uh, doing your surgery, you were the one who made the best decision, and that's how it, it should be. This is yeah. Michael Gray. <laughs> this is a great group, huh? Um, well, Aline, I mean, what if, do you think? If you don't have a return that clears weight at average cost of capital, you've destroyed value. I mean, there's some basics right. to this. Right. Having said that, I mean, I'll give you an example on sort of a smaller scale. When I was the CFO of Hydrogen Struggles, we really wanted to get into executive search and financial services. We kept hiring people. We kept trying to grow it organically. It never took off. We, we bought a small boutique. Most of the people actually left, to my earlier point, but we, we had uh, deals in place, so they stayed a couple of years. And that gave us a basis by which we built a very successful practice that ended up being the most lucrative practice for Hydric and about a third of the business. I'm not sure exactly how you measure that, but whatever we paid, which wasn't that much, even though we lost most of the people eventually who we brought in, you know, you're buying, when you're buying in a you know, professional services firm, you're mainly buying people in a book of business us, but you're mainly buying people. But it enhanced our ability to build a part of the business that we had been totally unsuccessful in doing organically. So I would say that was a success. Mm -hmm. Integration is a good thing and a bad thing, right? <laughs> you integrate, you get the values, you create, you know, all of the, you know, you show your business prop, you deliver against it. But guess what? 18 months out, 24 months out, it's hard to tease apart, right? Where the exact value creation came from, right? You assumed X, you delivered mm -hmm. Y, right? Where did it all come from? Uh, so I think 12 to 18 months, you probably have a little bit more visibility on, on what went well. I think that the place that we have to be careful is not look back and say, we missed our synergy here, we missed the forecasting here, right? We made a mistake there, because that then becomes part of the culture. M&A is risky inherently, right? I'm sure all of you have heard two thirds of the deals don't, you know, the destroy shareholder value versus creating value. So there is risk there. So it's more critical to say pick one or two small things, shorter horizon, and focus on did you bring new capability? Did you add new scale to the market, uh, right? Uh, culture changes. Mm -hmm. I think those are more important than just looking at, you know, going back to a business prop and saying, wow, I, 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 I delivered the return. Yeah. 
Let's, uh, let's open up and have some, some questions. And I, I, I smiled when integration kept coming up and sort of glancing over some integration friends. You know, that's one of the things I like about earnouts, particularly in professional services deals, because then people have skin in the game to stay. But the problem is they de-risk the deal, but then it's hard to integrate because you have to ring fence for the earnout right, calculation. Right, so right. there's no free launch in M&A. Yeah, exactly. So Nora's got a mic, Alyssa's got one. Let's have a question or two before we break. Must be some questions in the room. There we go, Chris Evans. I knew Chris would have a good question. Chris has got some war stories as well. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Evans. I, am, I worked at Amazon, running an integration team for 15 years, and now I'm an independent M&A advisor. And so just my question is, early on you said that the, the markets don't change your M&A strategy, and it should be long-term driven and strategy focused, um, but then m and is down 50%. And so what, what, do you think is in, what do you think impacts the decrease in M&A um, volume when, in theory, people should be following the same strategy, uh, the same long-term value, not trying to time the markets? Great question, Chris. Uh, I, you know, I think people are really, particularly at the beginning of the year, were really worried about a recession mm -hmm. and whether or not they were, they were buying earnings that were going to be half as much by the time they closed mm -hmm. the deal. Um, and, I, you know, I think that weighs on directors, it weighs on management, whether or not you've bought a falling knife. Mm -hmm. And it, it depends on the industry or and how strongly you felt that. But if you look at the, the sentiment among economists and business leaders in January, it was pretty bleak. So I'm not surprised at that. I mean, M&A is, there's a psychology to it. And I, you know, things didn't look great in January. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I think there are, there are different buckets of deals that happened. I think there are deals that are in motion or people who are thinking about doing a deal when you see a bad environment and if it's not a must have, people will slow it down a little bit. Yeah. So that kind of pushes out a little bit. The second is as the multiples drop, the companies that are using stock as a currency, they end up taking a break because either it's not affordable anymore or they want to preserve the value of their stock because it's falling. And third is, uh, I think in general, just when the market comes down, just the, I think you're talking about number of deals, but also the deal volume measured in the value of the transaction goes down significantly. So I think for some of the larger acquirers, it probably doesn't change as to how, what you want to go after and what you're going to buy. But I would say if you're in the middle of the market uh, and it, if you're using stock as a currency, that could be a, a factor. Mm -hmm. And the debt markets have certainly impacted the sponsors. I mean, I can tell you, I've worked as an advisor on a couple of deals that we were trying to do a year ago and they made sense. And, you know, they're, they were a push then, and now they just, it's hard to justify whether or not you can get return on them at this levels of debt cost. And that ties into the private equity. So the yeah. volume is down a lot because private equity is doing a lot less deals yep. now. Right. I think it's more on private equity than on strategics. Right, right. And we hear that a lot from sellers, right, that we would love to come to market, but it's not great. We'll just wait, right? Give us another six months, nine months, a year, right? So. Yeah. I mean, to, to your point, if you don't have to sell, why would you sell right now? Right, right, good. Well, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. We covered strategy, we, we covered some diligence and negotiation dynamics, and we've covered post-close measurements. So uh, I, I think you've helped us kick off what's gonna be a great couple of days, and so I'm grateful for the insights and perspective and uh, all the comments you shared. Thank you. Thank you, thanks.